And the second component of, of this legend or this tapestry, I guess, is that the operational parameters, both of the Allies and the German military, right at the end of the war, which on a conventional military explanation appear to make no sense, begin to make sense if you view it from the standpoint of this race against time that the Allies and the Nazis both were under to for the Nazis to perfect their weaponry and for the Allies to deny them its use. So you have crazy military deployments at the end of the war, uh, for example. Yeah, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, George Patton push into Czechoslovakia rather than turning north to Berlin and the heart of the Reich. Right, exactly so, exactly so. And this is mirrored uh, on the Nazi side with similar deployments by the Germans against the Russians where they would have their best battle-worthy formations far to the south of Berlin uh, around a German city by the name of Breslau. It's in modern-day Poland right now. But uh, at that point in the war, the most battle-worthy formations that the Germans had were south around Breslau. And there is so an actual... So, so what was so important about Breslau? Well, this, two things, actually. It was the largest city in an area of Germany that was kind of a hub for a lot of their very exotic black secret weapons projects. Uh, there is a component, of course, of the UFO legend that uh, states that the Nazis were working on various flying saucers in and around the environs of Breslau. But more importantly, it lay right in the Soviet line of advance towards Prague. So in other words, Hitler was very concerned to maintain his hold over Prague and central South Germany and, and north central Czechoslovakia as long as he could. And there's even a statement to him in effect that to his generals that uh, were questioning these, these mysterious deployments that made no military sense otherwise. There's even a statement by Hitler to the effect that Prague was the key for the Germans to win the war. So there's really a tapestry of things going on that are kind of all related if you view it from the standpoint of these exotic Nazi weapons projects. Uh -huh. um, of course, I think one of the most uh, amazing uh, contentions of your book is that um, although we had, we tested a plutonium bomb in Alamogordo in the spring of 1945, when we, the bomb we actually dropped on Hiroshima was a uranium bomb, and you point out the government documents showing that we really didn't have enough uranium for that. So uh, am I correct in, in getting your main contention is the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima may indeed have been a Nazi bomb? Yes, that that's one possibility. The other possibility that exists is that since we were so short of fissile uranium, that the uranium that was used in that bomb ultimately came from Nazi Germany, and that poses another problem. If it came from Nazi Germany, this means that they were much, much further along toward their own functioning bomb than the post-war Allied legend would have us believe. For if they were able to make fissile uranium, that's basically just one step away from assembling a bomb. But it's my belief that they actually did possess it. Uh -huh. Now, that brings to the $64,000 question. <laughs> had the bomb, and uh, as the Allies closed the noose around their neck, why didn't they use it? All right, there's there's two... I, there's two tracks to, ta to answer that question. Uh, one is the Germans may have been short of, of delivery systems to actually use the weapon. The other is that they may have actually been using the weapon or similar weapons of mass destruction of some sort on the Eastern Front, and it was in a desperation move on the Germans' part that they finally considered using it on the Western Allies. Um, I believe that if we examine some of the strange stories coming out of, of the Eastern Front, that you, you do end up with a picture of, uh, of a carnage there that simply goes beyond the ability of conventional military operations, especially on the Germans' part, to inflict on the Russians. So something's going on there that Stalin would have been absolutely loath to admit 
during the course of the war, actually, this would have been a disaster for Russian morale. So I think that, that there's two explanations, two possible explanations. They lacked delivery systems to any strategic targets of worth to the Allies. And secondly, they may have been using the bulk of these exotic weapons on the Eastern Front. But we were not told because Stalin was having trouble enough holding on to his own people under the conventional warfare, and if they thought they were uh, nu- nuclear weapons were being involved, they might have just totally deserted him. All right, exactly so, exactly. It's interesting, I mentioned this in the sequel to the, this book that's going to be out sometime this year. It's interesting that the Russian government, sometime I think in the last five years or so, came out and declassified their actual World War II casualties, and they are somewhat double what has been publicly admitted prior to this point. Now that oh means God. that so that's terrible because what they've admitted to so far doesn't it uh, come up to around thirty million or something like that? Right. So if if we're if we're looking at a figure between twenty five and thirty million, and it's some almost double that, then what we're looking at is is an operational competence on the part of the German army that's just almost miraculous. So operationally competent as they are or were at that time, it. It strains my credibility to believe that they were not doing something else on the Eastern Front. Um, well, isn't it also possible, I had this thought, because you, you go into <clears throat> very great detail about the Hans uh, Kommler, SS General Hans Kommler, and uh, his uh, special group that, towards the end of the war, more and more gained total control over the uh, Nazi Black operations, the uh, right. their technology uh, is it, and and we know that uh, towards the end of the war, Kamler told Werner von Braun that he was going to turn over the V two rockets and all the the rocket scientists to the Americans in exchange right. for leniency, and yet when he disappeared, uh, he had not done that, and they were simply scooped up by the Allies. Isn't it possible that uh, one of the reasons they did not set off the bomb against the Western Allies is that by the time they had the capability, they realized that the war was going to be lost anyway, and the person that had control over it, namely Kamler, uh, had decided, and probably Morton Borman, had decided to use that as a bargaining chip to uh, with the Western Allies. Is that possible? Right. I, I, that's, that is, is probably what happened. Uh, that scenario, that particular scenario, is actually advanced in a, in a wonderful book by another author, but an American author by the name of Carter Heydrich, and, and his book is called Critical Mass. And what this is is a component of a strategic evacuation plan that Martin Bormann himself uh, sort of hatched and oversaw toward the end of the war. And what this reveals is that the German atom bomb and, and rocket projects were not considered by the Nazis to be their most advanced and uh, potentially dangerous weapons. So, yes, they surrendered this to the Americans as a bargaining chip in return for their lives, but as we get further and further into their exotic projects, we find out that some of these things just go totally missing. You, you bring up Hans Kommler, and he, of course, goes totally missing at the end of the war, and nobody really knows where he went. <laughs> so, well, I have heard unconfirmed reports that he was seen in the United States in the years following the war, but, of course, uh, you can't seem to get any hard documentation on that. Right. Well, there's, there's. That he, yeah, it only makes sense that if he survived the war, and I suspect he did because he told Werner von Braun again. He told him, he says, uh, "You're not going to see me again. I'm going to disappear." So his disappearance was not an accident. It was not that he just got hit by a shell somewhere. Uh, you know, he he actually, uh, I think, survived the war, and it only makes sense that he would have, uh, been considering his rank and knowledge, that he would have been included in uh, Operation Paperclip, where they brought their German and Nazi specialists over to the United States. Right. Well, this this opens up a mystery because uh, Igor Witkowski, a, a Polish researcher, is the one who's who's pursued Kamler, and it's his opinion, uh, like yours, and it's really kind of my opinion, too, that Kamler probably made it to this country and, and went so deep and so black 
that uh, he he was never heard from again. But there is a certain body of evidence that that just came out in a in Britain in a book that suggests that he may have made it to Argentina as part of uh, a super secret negotiation that went on between Borman and, and the Perón government at the time. So there's two trails, and both of them lead to Nazis in exile, either in this country or in South America, where they're pursuing their, their exotic weapons technologies more or less independently. So there's two trails. We don't really know what happened to this guy, Kamler, and more significantly, we don't really know what he took with him. Well, and but the evidence seems to point to the fact that uh, somebody took something somewhere because... Uh... You make a very good uh, uh, comment and description of those U-boats that uh, suddenly turned up at the end of the war, and they were basically transportation U-boats, and they were empty. Right. So that doesn't right. indicate that they were probably moving something somewhere. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's it's impossible well, we given. Man. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, go go right ahead. Well, we, we're we're going to have to wrap it up for this section, and uh, we'll be right back. And uh, I want to ask you about uh, what uh, destroyed uh, this huge uh, uh, explosion in Sevastopol. And ah. we come back to this break. <laughs> okay. Good to go. Okay, we're back. This is your host, Jim Mars. I'm here with Joseph Farrell. And we are discussing the Nazi super weapons and the fact that the Nazis may have not only had nuclear weapons, but actually employed them, particularly on the Eastern Front. Uh, and Joseph, this leads to my question. Uh, in the conventional history, uh, there is a report that the Germans used this huge cannon. I can't remember. I, 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 it wasn't Big Bertha or Gustav, wasn't that the name? Gustav, of right. Yeah, good stuff. The idea was they used this giant cannon, which they did have, and that they lobbed a shell into Sevastopol and that it actually hit an ammo dump, which created this huge, huge, massive, destructive explosion. Is it right. possible that that might have been one of these nuclear weapons and that the Gustav shell hitting an ammo dump was just a cover story? That it it is very possible, and the reason why is that one of the other weapons that the Germans developed prior to the war that raises a whole host of, of other problems is the fuel air bomb. Now, for listeners who don't know, a fuel air bomb is essentially a conventional explosive with the explosive power or force of a tactical nuclear weapon. Well, a tactical nuclear weapon back then is a strategic weapon. It, it packs uh, just a gigantic punch. Now, Gustav was a 31 and a half inch bore caliber railway gun that straddled two parallel railway tracks. The barrel was some 100 feet long, and it was capable of lobbing a seven ton shell, that's a conventional shell, to a distance of about 29 miles. So the Germans used this thing during the siege of, of Sevastopol on the Russian front in 1942. And there is a Japanese report that I mentioned in my book that mentions that the Germans had used something in the Crimea during the war. And I believe that possibly the Germans were using these gigantic conventional artillery systems either to deliver small-sized tactical nuclear weapons or a fuel air bomb of some sort. And I do get into this a bit in the sequel, too, there is a report uh, that Otto Skorzeny, Hitler's celebrated commando that rescued Mussolini in the war, that he records in 1941 during the Battle of Moscow, the Russians told the Germans to cease and desist what they were doing or the Russians would start using poison gas. Well, what the Germans were doing were using rocket-launched artillery to deliver these fuel air bombs on Russian positions. Now, that's, <laughs> that's unfortunately, that's kind of like saying... Uh, the words carpet bombing and tactical nukes in the same phrase. So you sure, can imagine the steel air bomb it could be very could be have almost equivalent destructiveness as a small tactical nuke. Right, right. So you can imagine the, an effect of a battery of these things firing fuel air bombs on Russian positions. The poor Russians, you know, don't have anything to match this. 
So their response to Berlin is, if you keep this up, we're, we're going to start using poison gas. And, of course, that was and, anathema to Hitler. Yeah, that was an anathema to everyone. That's why... Uh, that's why for the listeners out there, you see these war movies and these German soldiers are all carrying these little canisters around with them. Those were gas mask canisters. And on both right. sides, almost to the end of the war, both sides were just deathly afraid that the other would be using poison gas or chemicals. And, and so to threaten that the use of that shows the uh, seriousness with what the Russians took with whatever it was the Germans were using on them. Right, absolutely, absolutely. This is the strongest indicator that there is much, much more going on on the Eastern Front that falls outside of the realm of conventional military weaponry and that the Germans were willing to use it. And now, that brings if, 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 uh, if, all, if all this is true, then one of the uh, probably the top U.S. commander who probably would have known of this high technology being used by the Nazis must have been uh, George Patton, right? Right. This is this is another aspect of the legend. Patton's Third Army drives just a hell bent for leather across southern Germany and on into Czechoslovakia, making a, an absolute beeline for the big Skoda armaments works at, at Pilsen and then subsequently towards Prague. Now, this is interesting for the story because Pilsen is exactly where SS General Kammler had centered his his secret weapons think tank. And I use the word think tank advisedly because what he did was he recruited top scientists from all over occupied Europe into this program, and he fr essentially freed them from the constraints of Nazi ideology and just told them, go to it, go brainstorm, come up with uh, radical ideas and, and how to get there. And as a part of this think tank, they even had their own top secret magazine that circulated private uh, secret scientific reports amongst these scientists. So Patton, if we look at the Third Army's operations at the end of the war, it's very clear that Patton's Third Army is driving towards the nerve centers of this Black Project's empire. And this means that Patton either has been privy to some intelligence, or if he's not, he's been directed to do so. And once his units enter these areas, then he becomes privy to the intelligence of his field reports. So he's sitting in a pretty good position to know exactly what's been going on inside of Nazi Germany. And that, of course, lends a lot of weight in my mind to the allegation that Patton may have actually been murdered. Right, violence. exactly, exactly. And if there's a motive the explanation to... of why. Right, right. If there's if there's a motive to do it, this is probably it because Patton, of course, had a, a rather big mouth. And if if one puts oneself in the, in the shoes of some paranoid Allied intelligence officers, they're thinking, "Oh my word! You know, this general knows all of this stuff. We've we've got to make sure he keeps his mouth shut." Now, Patton, in my opinion, would never have have blurted out anything untoward on on that respect. But but you can't think that way if you're an Allied intelligence or security officer. Well, of course, it was Patton who was publicly stating that we should just continue the war and move right on into Russia and take them out, too. Right, and, exactly. Uh, since Hitler, with his massive mechanized force, was unable to do that, then that tells me Patton may have known that we now had the weaponry to accomplish the deed. Bingo, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it all makes a lot of sense. Um Another part of the book that I think will fascinate your readers is tell us about the proposed Nazi atomic bombing of Manhattan. Oh, boy. This this was something that really was an eye-opener for me. I found a, a map that the Oberkommando der Luftwaffe had published, in, well, not published, but circulated as a, as a private top-secret intelligence briefing in 1943. And this map, it's reproduced in the book, it literally shows a map of lower Manhattan Island. You can see the circles drawn over Manhattan Island for a blast and then for heat damage radiuses of an atomic bomb going off with the yield that is approximately the same as that we used in Hiroshima in 1945. Now, the thing about this map 
is that it was done in 1943. So, in other words... They either had the bomb or they felt like they were close enough that they could draw up operational plans. Right. And and it's it's interesting that you mention that because if they're drawing blast and, and heat damage radii on, on the map for a bomb of the approximate yield of Hiroshima, then they've done the calculations. They know exactly what's going to happen. And their their targeting is also interesting. It's it's centered directly over Lower Manhattan Island, almost in the center of the financial district there. So this is a carefully calculated plan, and and as you say, they are gambling that they're going to get it and going to get it first, and and planning ahead to do so. Well, that's simply amazing. And this, I guess, leads to my ultimate question for you, Joseph, which is. You have made some astounding uh, allegations here that the Germans uh, were much further along with atomic research that they even may have actually used tactical nukes on the Eastern Front and that they were simply hamstrung somewhat by uh, lack of a delivery system um, and that actually they were already beyond atomics and looking into even stranger and more exotic uh <laughs> Weaponry such as uh, zero point energy, uh, uh-huh. the uh, you know destruction at the atomic and subatomic level. Right. My question is, how you you have been privy to documents that have only recently been made available because of the reunification of Germany. Uh, how confident are you in these allegations? Uh, reasonably so. There is one very interesting project that I talk about in that book. I talk about it somewhat in uh, the second book of, uh, that I wrote on the Great Pyramid, and, I, and the sequel to Reich of the Black Sun is almost exclusively devoted to this project and its implications. And this project is what's, called The Bell. This device... What's the, what's, uh, the t- what's the title of your new book so we can all... Listen? Oh, the, the, the sequel uh, to Rack of the Black Sun is going to be called The SS Brotherhood of the Bell, and it will be coming out uh, by Adventures Unlimited Press, which publishes Rack of the Black Sun. All right, so we're going to pause for this uh, short break, and when we come back, we'll discuss the SS Brotherhood of the Bell. This is your host, Jim Mars, and we're talking with author Joseph Farrell. Welcome back to Dreamland. I'm your host, Jim Mars. Today we're talking with Joseph Farrell about his new book, Reich of the Black Sun, Nazi Secret Weapons and the Cold War Allied Legend, available from uh, Adventures Unlimited books, and also available, of course, here on the uh, Whitley Strieber website, Unknown Country. Just check in the bookstore. Uh, before the break, Joseph, you were about to discuss the SS Brotherhood of the Bell, and this is indeed an intriguing story. Tell us about it. Well, the Bell was the Third Reich's most highly classified secret weapons project. It was given a a classification called Kriegsentscheidend, which translates as decisive for the war. It was the only weapons project to be given this classification. In other words, it's a classification higher than the atomic bomb. The physicist that they had in charge of this project was one Walter Gerlach, who, of course, is the Nobel Prize-winning physicist from 1921. His specialty, it's interesting to to know what his specialty was, because it was gravitational physics and, and magnetic polarization. Now, this is the fellow that's nominally in charge of their atom bomb project. But the Bell is the project that he's tied directly with. And if you look at what the Bell was, it appears to have been some sort of device to cohere or to tap into the zero-point energy. And what they were looking for initially, I believe, was was anti-gravity or propulsion. And all accounts that are available of this device and its operation uh, indicate that it was wildly successful. The problem is the Bell, along with General Kamler and all of its project documentation, go completely missing (laughs) at the end of the war. And Gerlach, who's taken to Farm Hall in England with the other German atom bomb scientists and their conversations are recorded, well, Gerlach also 
was, of all of those scientists, the only scientist brought over to this country after his interrogation by the British to be interrogated over here, and his war diaries are still lost and classified. He cannot get them. They're still locked up. After the war, he returns to Germany, and he never writes another word on this device that the Germans called the bell. Now, it's interesting. They called it a bell because it was actually shaped like a bell, right? Right. It was shaped like a bell. It looked. It was about 15 feet tall, maybe 9 to 12 feet wide. Uh, it was a ceramic. It was cased in ceramic. Uh, inside, it had two counter-rotating drums into which was poured, apparently, some highly radioactive form of mercury, a mercury isotope, and probably it would have other radioactive elements in suspension in the mercury. And I think what they were trying to do was to spin the mercury so fast, electrically and mechanically, to get all of the atoms in the mercury lined up, spinning in the same direction, so that essentially, with these two drums rotating in opposite directions, you'd cancel out the magnetic field and create kind of a little uh, space-time bubble around this thing. It had some some shocking uh, side effects that initially, I think, probably surprised the Germans, but uh, they did learn eventually how to control these things. But the interesting thing, again, about this project is unlike their atom bomb, unlike their rockets, no one knows where it went after the war. It was probably except perhaps, part... except perhaps to Kecksburg. <laughs> draw, <laughs> draw the connection. Draw the connection between the Nazi development of the Bell and the thing that crashed at Kecksburg. All right. Well, that that's one of the interesting speculations in the book. Uh, one of the things I notice about the UFO crash at, at Kecksburg is if you read all the eyewitness accounts, they describe an object that is acorn-shaped, approximately 9 to 12 feet tall and about 9 to 12 feet wide. So whatever crashed in Kecksburg has the same shape and approximately the same dimensions as the bell. And moreover, it's interesting to me that so shortly after the whatever crashed at Kecksburg. So shortly after the crash, the military shows up, along with some NASA engineers and so on, and basically cordon off the city and cart out whatever it was that crashed there. So I, I'm probably the only one to have drawn the connection between Kecksburg and this missing device that, that the Nazis smuggled out of Germany at the end of the war called the Bell. And, and the connection is entirely based on the shape and, and dimensions of the object. Uh, that's really amazing, but that also lends uh, some support to the idea that early on the uh, the reports of alien flying saucers and UFOs may have actually been a cover to uh, yes. uh, to cover for the fact that we were testing uh, these Nazi super weapons. Either yes, exactly so. A deep, a sort of a deep layer cover story, and either we were testing them, or somebody else was, and somebody else means probably Nazis continuing their projects more or less independently somewhere. Nobody knows where. But the important point here is, as you say, somebody's testing exotic technology. Uh, in, in the case of Kecksburg, it's my belief that it got away from them and, and they brought it down there and, and recovered it, or stole it from whoever was testing it. But uh, it's it's an interesting speculation. Amazing. Now, you say that that could have been Nazis operating from somewhere, and in your book you actually deal with uh, that subject. Uh, it is well known and well documented that plenty of top Nazis escaped through the rat lines to Argentina, Paraguay, and other points in South America and also to Egypt. But you also deal with the uh, concept of Agartha, the secret Shangri-La that was prepared for top Nazis in Antarctica. And it is right. well documented that the Nazis prior to the World War II made extensive expeditions to Antarctica and, and basically took over the area that had formerly been known as Queen Maud Land and turned it into New Schwabenland. And uh, how... 
confident to you that they may have actually built a huge underground base in Antarctica. Well, I, I'm not overly confident. Uh, it would have been difficult for them to do so. But I don't discount the idea simply because there is so much that they were able to accomplish inside of Nazi Germany with the use of, of concentration camp slave labor and so on that really, uh, even since the reunification, they're still discovering some of these installations that, that people either had forgotten about or had never even known existed. So it really doesn't strain credibility that much to believe that the Nazis may have deported some of these concentration camp workers and, and uh, German contract laborers and specialists to Antarctica or to Argentina or other places in South America during the war to build some of these compounds. Now, in that regard, we can look also at, at something that Perón did for the Nazis, and that was he constructed a very up-to-date, modern, expensive, and large plasma physics laboratory for them at Bariloche in, in Argentina, where some of these scientists subsequently went to continue pursuing their research. So it really uh, comes down, I think, to where one wants to believe on that. I, I kind of lean toward the idea that, that the Nazis did have something going on in Argentina, but no one really knows how large or how extensive it was. Correct. Now, I agree with you that if they had taken a force to uh, Antarctica and were forced to start from scratch and, and tunnel and, and build under ice and under the ground, that would have been very difficult. But it's been documented that they reported that they had found uh, warm lakes underground and right. uh, even... Even certain enclaves were, and we now know we've, we've discovered the same thing with the underground right. lake. So if it was, if it was possible if they found an underground area, like a vast cavern or whatever that had warm lakes, uh, then it would not have required that much extensive labor work to go ahead and build a base there. True, that true. Clear? True. They they would have been able to exploit things that they found there and, and, and constructed bases. And again, no one really knows the extent of what they did find. So, you know, we do have we do have other corroboration. Uh, Admiral Byrd's expedition to Antarctica has a suspiciously military look and feel to it. And then of course recently uh Nexus magazine has come out with a series of articles that, that the British actually mounted secret expeditions after the end of the war in Antarctica. So Something's going on down there, and, and uh, it most likely concerns the, the Germans, uh, the Nazis in exile after the end of the war. That's uh, that's really amazing speculation, but but uh, it is based and grounded in a smattering of facts and information. Uh, for example, you mentioned Admiral Byrd's uh, expedition to. Antarctica immediately after the war, and by most accounts, they they had losses, and they basically turned tail and, and ran back home. <laughs> yep, that's we right. Will, let's, conti let's continue that line of thought when we come back from this break. This is your host, Jim Mars, and we're talking with Joseph Farrell. Welcome back. This is your host, Jim Mars. Today, we're talking with author Joseph Farrell, uh, regarding his new book, Reich of the Black Sun, Nazi Secret Weapons and the Cold War Allied Legend. And we were talking about the Admiral Byrd expedition to Antarctica in, I believe that was 1947, Joseph? Yeah, 1947. Early early 1947, the planning uh, was initiated sometime in 46. I, I believe it was the summer of 46, but I'm not certain of that. So this was immediately after the close of hostilities in, in Europe and in Japan. And uh, what can you tell us about that ex exhibition, expedition? Uh, I've always been fascinated with that, Joseph, and I have tried and tried to find hard documentation. And there seems to be just kind of a black hole there. Uh, what can you tell us about that expedition? Well, as far as documentation goes, you're right. Uh, there are consistent... Uh, stories to the effect that Admiral Byrd's diaries of the expedition are classified. However, there is one newspaper article from El Mercurio newspaper in, in Santiago, Chile, 
that I do reproduce in the book where Admiral Byrd is given his famous quotation where he's trying to warn America from the danger of enemy fighters that can fly from pole to pole with tremendous speed. And uh, given the fact that, of course, Soviet Russia at the time hadn't mounted or, or expressed much of an interest in Antarctica, that leaves only really one other enemy to consider, and that would be Nazi Germany. Uh, it's interesting that he makes this remark, and then, of course, once he gets back to Washington, D.C., he's debriefed, his diaries and, and uh, operational logs are, are kept under lock and key and classified, and then we have a whole host of strange things begin to occur, Secretary Forrestal and, and his death, and then uh, the UFO sightings of Kenneth Arnold, and then ultimately Roswell. And I think what's going on here, if we look at all this together, in the case of Roswell, the, the Magic 12 documents, uh, if one accepts for the sake of argument that some of these things are, are genuine, one of the things that, that struck me as extremely odd was that they mentioned that the German paperclip scientists are brought in to look at the Roswell wreckage. And I, I, I came to the conclusion that this would be a very odd thing for the U.S. military to do if it thought that this craft was exclusively extraterrestrial in nature. Why bring in German paperclip scientists? They'd, that, they'd want to keep them... That would be kind of like basically showing your former enemies some of your most secret uh, matters. Exactly, exactly. They, they would have been kept out of the loop of that if that had been the case. But something about the craft must have looked peculiarly German. And even Corso in, in his book, The Day After Roswell, mentions this. Something about the craft had to have looked peculiarly German. So they bring in these paperclip scientists to look at it and ask them what they think about it. Well, the paperclip scientists respond, well, no, it's nothing that we've ever seen before. It's, it's not one of ours. But after they say this, they then go on to speculate on what makes the thing fly. Uh, and we come up with uh, fusion and, and charge differentials and everything else. Now, why Von Braun would have come up with an idea like that as a rocket scientist is, is kind of absurd unless we put in one more significant detail. And that detail is a fellow by the name of, of Dr. Kurt Davis. And I talk about him extensively in, in the sequel, The SS Brotherhood of the Bell. Dr. Kurt Davis was one of the people involved with the projects at Painaminda. However, Painaminda and Davis are kind of an odd match because Davis' specialty is not rocket science. It's high-voltage electrical discharge. Now, I found this extremely interesting because there's a, there's a fairly well-known picture of Von Braun and Davis at NASA with Davis pointing his finger up towards something on the wall or, or off in the distance. And Davis, at this time, is the director of the Kennedy Space Flight Center. So, you know, I, you have to ask yourself, what is a fellow whose specialty isn't even rocket science doing as a director of the Kennedy Space Flight Center? And then, why does Von Braun, when he goes to look at the Roswell wreckage in the Magic 12 documents, presume to think that the propulsion is based on some sort of fusion reactor driving a charge differential? <laughs> so... Uh, something more is going on here. Right. But now, the stuff that strikes me is, is if this was our work, meaning the United States, if this was our work uh, trying to continue and expand upon the groundwork laid by the Nazi scientists, uh, you, you would not think that they would bring the paperclip scientists in or they would even have these documents stating what is this. So it exactly. would almost indicate, yeah, it would almost indicate that that the whatever crashed at Roswell was outside the purview of their experience and knowledge. Exactly, exactly. And this is this again brings us back to what the Bell represented. The Bell was really at the cusp of the kind of physics that the Germans were doing during the war, and it was completely outside the box of of the nice linear relativistic way of thinking that the rest of, of the world physicists had become accustomed to thinking in. The Germans were, were totally outside of that box during the 12 years of the war. So 
it stands to reason then that when they constructed their experiments and, and their physics, they were based on very, very different paradigms that were very far ahead of their time for that time period. Exactly. Now, let me ask you your personal thoughts. Do you feel like that uh, the UFOs that have been reported in ever-increasing quantity since World War II, uh, do you feel like that they are exclusively these Nazi super weapons either being used by Nazis or perhaps being tested by the United States? Or do you feel that it might be a mixture and that there may be a genuine extraterrestrial aspect to some of these sightings? Well, let me put it this way. Um, it would be impossible for, especially after the war, for Nazi UFOs to account for all of the sightings. However, they do show up in odd places. The ghost rockets over Sweden, for example, uh, the, the sightings in America over military installations. Well, if we remember that the Baltic coast of Germany and the, and the southern coast of Sweden during the war were both highly militarized districts, uh, it becomes feasible that this UFO activity, which is always associated with, with military science at that particular time period, has an explanation. So, yeah, I believe that, that Nazi technology, at least in these early post-war sightings, may represent some of what is being seen. Now, but as regards all. this, pardon me? But not all. But not all, right. Okay. But now this raises the philosophical question. Um, personally, I, I have no problem with other alternative life forms uh, and so on and so forth. But my problem with mo the majority of UFO sightings is I have not yet seen a physics in the objects themselves, with the exception of some of the video footage from the space shuttle, that satisfies me that these are, are craft capable of interstellar flight. They are certainly advanced craft, some of these other UFO sightings, but I don't think the physics is sufficient to explain them as extraterrestrial. The, the only things that I, I've seen that, that look like they have a physics that could be sufficient to be extraterrestrial are some of these space shuttle footings that are, that are rather extraordinary. Right. So well, I think it's uh, probably a mixture of things. Yes, I agree. I think we have a mix here. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, you're not the only one to notice the uh, lack of uh, intergalactic capability on the part of uh, a lot of the descriptions of UFOs, which, of course, has led researchers to conclude that most of the UFOs are probably uh, in the area of shuttlecraft. They're short-range uh, mm -hmm. craft. Uh, mm -hmm. which means that perhaps there's a mothership out there somewhere. Um, but then again, you yourself have brought up this uh, this uh, electromagnetic vortex-type uh, technology, which uh, if they were able to push that to its ultimate capacity, conceivably could create some sort of a Einstein-Rosen bridge or wormhole which would allow them to travel great distances without, uh, you know, the conventional rockets and, and uh, stockpiles of supplies and everything else. Is that conceivable? Well, it's conceivable that the, the vortex physics that the Germans were investigating unlocked some very peculiar doors. Uh, as far as an Einstein-Rosen bridge is concerned or, or a wormhole, at least the conventional physics models that, or papers that you can read in the available literature, most of those suggest that the wormhole would require enormous amounts of energy and it would be far too small for anything physical to get through. Now, that's kind of a six of one, half a dozen of the other explanation because we really don't have, in my opinion, at least in the public physics models, any good models for what vortex mechanics and some of these things that the Nazis were working on during the war might do. So, you know, it, it, the, the door towards speculation on that point, I think, is, is wide open. <laughs> it just flies right open, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, one thing when we're talking about Nazi UFOs that always comes to my mind is the... Uh, 
very famous case of Betty and Barney Hill and their abduction uh-huh. back in the 60s. And uh, you're probably aware that under hypnosis, Barney Hill was talking <laughs> about the people in the craft, and he said, why, he's wearing a Nazi uniform. Yes, yeah. In fact, I, I use that as an epigraph in, in the sequel to, to Reich of the Black Sun. I, I point out uh, that this is indeed one of the things that Barney Hill records. Uh, so, you know, if if that happened and, and if there is a continuing Nazi project or somebody else took it over and is, was developing it, uh, you know, it, it opens up other doors of speculation that aren't really too pleasant to contemplate. Um, <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Because, uh, you know, there's plenty of political commentators today, uh, particularly to the left of center, uh, who are trying to compare events in this country today with events in Nazi Germany and claiming that the Bush administration is uh, tending to be uh, uh, fascistic. Uh, do you see those same parallels? Oh, yes. Um not only parallels in terms of, of what's going on, I, I certainly uh, myself am kind of apolitical. I'm, I'm not too crazy about the left or the right in this country because I, I tend to think of them as kind of Hegelian thesis and antithesis. Uh, well, they're, they're circular. When you get the extreme yeah, right exactly. and the extreme left, they tend to come together, don't they? Right. And uh, that plus the the technological potential that governments now have, uh, that and, and some of the moves going on in terms of American civil liberties and, and law, they frighten me immensely. And uh, if we add in Nazi technology and, and uh, perhaps some sort of military program that lies behind some of the cases of abduction, then then we are indeed dealing with, with a very sinister agenda. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, tell us a little bit about the sequel, the follow-on to Reich of the Black Sun, that uh, SS Brotherhood of the Bell. Is that going to deal exclusively with the Bell and its technology? Yeah, it uh, it's it's divided into three sections, and, and I kind of pick up uh, where Reich of the Black Sun left off and examine some of the peculiar military operations toward the end of the war from the standpoint of technology, like the Battle of the Bulge and its relation to technology, uh, the possible German testing of intercontinental rockets shortly before the end of the war. And then I go in the second section of the book into a detailed uh, description of the bell, where it was tested, who was involved that we know was involved with it, uh, what happened to them, what the Bell's signature effects were, what the underlying physics behind it may have been. And then uh, in the third component, you'll be delighted to know I get into some of the political ramifications. Uh, <laughs> and they lead, they lead to subjects of other mutual interest between us. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, I look forward to that, make sure I get one, and we'll, we'll continue this discussion. Um, All righty. So as, as we close down here, though, I have to ask you about the 40 giant bombers on a airfield near Oslo, Norway. Oh, boy. Uh, and tell us about that, and tell us why that these were never utilized in the closing days of the war. Well, there, there was an article in a British newspaper that appeared right after the end of the war when the Allies sent their forces into Norway to accept the German surrender of the troops there. And outside of Oslo, they found a, that the Luftwaffe and the SS had constructed a massive airfield capable of handling extremely large bombers. And much to their surprise, the, the British found there approximately 40 to 50 very long-range uh, strategic bombers that were being held in readiness, according to the, what the German officers told them, for a strike against New York. Now, it's a mystery as to why these things were never used, because, again, uh, they, we don't know what they were held in readiness for. There's some speculation in some quarters that Hitler was wanting to use uh, dirty nuke bombs on New York. Uh, some others maintain that he was ready to use biological or chemical weapons on New York. 
And of course, there's the final alternative that he was ready to to drop an atomic bomb, or maybe several on, on New York or the area. No one really knows why they weren't used, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is they were there and being held in readiness for an attack. Well, the only thing that comes to my mind, uh, based on what I know and based on what you have here in your book, is that uh, they weren't used because the people who had command over those weapons, namely Kamler and Morton Borman, uh, by the end of the war uh, were right. heading deals secret deals with the Allies, and you don't want to drop a bomb on the very people you're trying to negotiate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Joseph Farrell talking about Reich of the Black Sun, Nazi secret weapons and the Cold War Allied legend. This has been a fascinating conversation, Joseph. And no, I've enjoyed it. Okay. Out, let's do it again. All right. Good enough. I've enjoyed it. This is Jim Mars, and you've been listening to Dreamland. Next up on Dreamland, Linda Moulton Howe. You're about to experience something that you just can't get elsewhere. Emmy Award winning science reporter Linda Moulton Howe reporting on the absolute leading edge of science discovery and the true mysteries of the unknown. Don't miss her website, earthfiles.com, the one science website that tells you the secrets and gives you the facts the others dare not. Earthfiles.com. This week she's reporting on a repeating crop circle phenomenon in Australia and also that, that coral die off in the Caribbean. Very serious stuff. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. It was only eight months ago, in August 2005, before Hurricane Katrina hit land on August 29th, that the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean water temperatures were the warmest on record going back to the beginning of record-keeping 100 years ago. Water west of Florida and the Keys measured 79 degrees Fahrenheit down to a depth of 150 meters. That's more than the length of a football field, and that means a gigantic area of water that was not only huge on the surface but went down so far. And never in weather records had two Category 5 hurricanes occurred within three weeks of each other in the same hurricane season and on the same path. Those gigantic storms were Katrina followed by Rita, both fed by all that warm water in the Caribbean. Today, we know the 2005 hurricane season had the greatest number of intense storms ever. Dominated by Katrina, which is now in the record books as the most expensive natural disaster in American history. With global warming expected to keep raising the world's average mean temperature for the remainder of this century, ocean waters are also expected to be warmer. Those warmer ocean temperatures mean more chances for another Katrina and the decline and die off of one of the world's most valuable life forms coral reefs. Coral reefs are like rainforests in the oceans, which provide shelter to more than 25% of all marine life. In only the past 25 years, 35 million acres of coral reefs have been completely destroyed, largely by human activities that range from water pollution to dynamite fishing and ramming boats into the fragile reefs. If the present rate of destruction continues, 70% of the world's coral reefs will be entirely gone in a few decades. Like dominoes falling, when the reefs die, whole populations of fish, marine animals, and plants have to move to survive. And survival is not guaranteed without the protective reefs. Now comes sobering new data from the National Park Service, NOAA, and Caribbean scientists that the warm Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean waters of 2005 caused the biggest coral reef die-off on record. Unprecedented, says Mark Eakin, Ph.D. in biological oceanography and coordinator for NOAA's Coral Reef Watch based in Silver Spring, Maryland. 
What we've seen in using our global satellite data is that the warming in the Caribbean in 2005 was the largest that we've ever seen. From the satellite data, we see that the thermal stress to which the corals were exposed was greater than any that we've seen in the last 20 years of record. And if we look at just average temperatures of the Eastern Caribbean, September, when the major warming was going on in the Eastern Caribbean, it was the warmest September that we have seen in the last 100 years of record. Mm. The result of this was bleaching that extended throughout much of the Caribbean. So in some areas, such as in the Virgin Islands, they saw over 90% of their corals bleached and more than 20% mortality Mm -hmm. on average. That wasn't just in that part of the Caribbean. This level of bleaching extended across the entire Eastern Caribbean and was preceded by bleaching in the Florida Keys, in the Flower Garden Banks off Texas, and reefs off Panama Mm -hmm. and Belize. So this was an event that went across the entire Caribbean. Right now, as we're speaking, there's uh, another area of warm water off of Fiji and Tonga. And we've just heard reports that there's some mild bleaching going on in those areas. And the bleaching is almost always associated with warmer water that causes the symbiotic algae to leave the coral animal? That's correct. The same warm water throughout the Gulf and across the uh, tropical Atlantic that led to the most intense Atlantic hurricane season on record was the same water that led to the coral bleaching. So we're looking at a large-scale climate event that has many impacts. If we are in global warming and we can't suddenly reduce the CO2 blanket and methane that's warming the planet, then what is the worst-case future for marine life and coral It's hard to really say what the worst case is. There are a wide range of different scenarios that have come out from the scientific community. What we do know, though, is that we expect an increase in ocean temperatures as well as an increase in atmospheric temperatures. And as those temperatures increase, coral bleaching events become more frequent and become more severe. How severe and how frequent they're going to be uh, depends on a lot of things that are still uncertain in the model. So it would be difficult to really project how corals are going to respond over the next 100 years. And is it fair to say that the die-off of the coral in the 2005 to 2006 event is as much as 30% in some areas of the Caribbean? I've seen numbers that exceed 25%. The important part is these surveys are still going on now, Mm -hmm. and so the extent of this event are still being learned. And it is unprecedented. Absolutely. One of the most recent science reports about the unprecedented Caribbean coral die-off came from Professor Hernandez Delgado at the University of Puerto Rico. He found only a few days ago that a colony of 830-year-old star coral that was more than 13 feet high is now all dead. This surprising death, along with so many other reef corals, has only happened in the past four to five months. That nearly 1,000-year-old coral had survived a lot of previous climate changes until now. This week, I asked a fisheries biologist with the U.S. National Park Service in the Virgin Islands if the death of 830-year-old star corals in 2006 could mean in the future all coral reefs could die. That is a very grave concern. When we have a ship that runs aground, they can pulverize a number of 800-year-old coral colonies as well. But isn't his point that in 800 years this does not happen to the Puerto Rico star coral before now, which means that whatever the conditions are, they are worse than they have been for 800 years. Well, we can say that the cumulative effect of everything had a fatal result on that coral colony. And it's absolutely disturbing that that happened. There's no doubt. It's On one hand, I feel 
very honored to be able to see these corals, and then I feel very sad watching them die and knowing there's nothing I can do about them, that they have lived for so long, and I have to sit there and go out week after week and watch them disappear. It is very troublesome. It is very discouraging, but yet we have to keep trying to do something for the aspects that we can manage, and we have to keep researching what caused that 830-year-old coral to die. Was it a bacterial infection? Was it a combination of different types of bacteria? What was the connection between the bleaching event and the coral disease that caused it to die in such a short period of time? Absolutely. Those are questions that we have to answer. And thank goodness he was there to document it so we can raise it to a national priority and say, let's do some genetic work and find out what really happens on a DNA level when these corals get sick. I mean, you think it's hard to figure out how you catch the flu, uh, imagine trying to figure out how a coral gets sick. If all the coral in the Caribbean and other places where there are coral reefs did die, what would be the worst case for the oceans? If all the coral were to die, um, boy, you know, I don't think there would be a time when all the coral dies. Reefs have survived a number of times through geologic time and come back. I think what we're seeing is that the reefs as we know them would change and different components would move in, sponges, uh, macroalgae. What happens when we lose reefs is, is there would be more shoreline erosion. The fisheries would certainly be affected to a large degree. Islands that depend upon those fish for sources of protein and food would certainly be affected by the decline of reefs. There are serious downstream consequences of coral decline, more so than just, geez, there won't be anything there to look at when I go on vacation. There are some substantial consequences. This week, hurricane forecasters at Colorado State University announced that the 2006 hurricane season will be busy with more large storms than normal, but they don't expect it to be as terrible as last year. Their projections are based on complex data that changes from season to season, and let's hope they are right and there is not another Katrina But coral reef scientists are very concerned that as water temperatures climb this summer, more coral will bleach and die. Hot temperatures have also been plaguing Australia. On March 28th, the air around Conondale, Queensland on the East Coast was unusually warm and still. It was so still that residents remember the calm heat. There were no thunderstorms or wind. And yet two beautiful spiral circles in tall wild grass were found only about a mile and a half north of where four beautifully spiraled circles were discovered in a line also on March 28th, but two years ago in 2004, and the year before that, back in 2003, in the same region, residents reported unusual down grass in more random shapes. These two on March 28th are the first circles reported in the world this year. What is it about Conondale? It's a small dairy farm community a couple of hours by car northwest of uh, Brisbane. It's also suspected there is a lot of underground water there because in the region there is a crystal waters community, it's called, supplied by a river. Underground water flowing beneath the limestone of Great Britain has also been discussed as one of the reasons for crop formation focus there. But no one knows for certain. Whatever is the reason, something has visited Conondale at least three times to interact with the tall grasses without leaving tracks or signs of disturbance around the circles. This year, one of the two circles is 8 meters in diameter, or about 27 feet. The smaller is about half that size at 4 meters, or about 13 feet. Two years ago, in 2004, the largest of those four circles that were in a straight line measured almost eight meters also, about the same as this year. And the next size down in 2004 was also four meters, again, like the smallest circle this year. There were two others in 2004. One was almost a meter, and another one was 1.8 meters. And it's very interesting that those four circles in 2004 were aligned exactly 20 degrees east of magnetic north. And this year, these two new circles 
are aligned just four degrees east of magnetic north. This week, I talked with the photographer I interviewed in 2004, who also went to these two new circles to photograph. He is Christopher White, a gardener and handyman now living in Mullaney. His many and beautiful photographs of the 2006 circles are at my news website, earthfiles.com, and you can see it by going to the top headline report about this Australian grass circle event this year. Now, he photographed in 2004 at night, and he ended up with unusual glowing orbs in many frames which he did not see with his eyes. This year, he and his colleagues photographed during the day, and none of his images have glowing orbs in them. And I asked if he would compare the lay of the grass in these 2006 circles to those in 2004. The grasses seem to be laid down in a very similar manner giving this lovely sort of lumpy rippled effect all the way around the perimeter especially. Both of the two circles this time had very, very similar cone centres. The large circle had a cone, must be nearly a metre wide. They were all laid clockwise and the smaller circle, I think it was about 4.2 metres or 3.8, I'm not quite certain, had some lovely little short bits of green grass left vertically in the center with a very slight um, twist to them, which was actually kind of pretty. I know that one of the friends that we had there, Anya, took a pendulum in there, which swung quite wildly east and west, although the circles in alignment were north and south. And I believe the pendulum also swung strongly anti-clockwise for a while. Outside of the circles, it just swung a little bit north and south. Since you all were there for an hour or so, could you find any evidence of any tracks or any grass disturbance of any kind around the two circles? Not that I know of, no. I certainly didn't, and no one else did it as far as we know either. It did look, some of the grass had just started to spring up again because the green blady grass are really quite big, strong lumps of tussocky sort of material really and it would have taken some interesting force to actually bend it down and ripple it into the rest of the grasses without damaging it. We saw no sign of holes with where people could stick poles in the center or anything like that. Do you know what the weather conditions were like around March 28th? They were fairly warm actually, fairly warm and sunny. We've had quite a hot year. But no uh, thunderstorms or wind? No, not those days. Okay, so March 28th, it was hot and still. Yes. Would that be the same kind of weather condition in 2004, do you remember? From memory, very similar, I think. The morning was a bit cooler, I think, uh, back then. So for people who say, well, it's got to be wind coming down and spinning these circles, what do you say? nonsense. Because? My own research, if you like, into crop circles and things is um, that that just doesn't really occur. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone did actually, I think was it the farmer's wife, no, another lady drove by and was kind of intrigued and she said uh, something to do with uh, whirlywings and things like that and it's like, no, (laughs) (laughs) definitely not whirlywings. But just because the the beauty of the the central cones of the, uh, the circles themselves and the way the surrounding grasses are not touched at all, and not being actually in a vertical crop, if you like, the edges were still clean and tidy. We couldn't find any evidence of broken or trampled grass anywhere. And those centers, in England, I have seen those beautiful raised centers, sometimes as far as 12 inches off the ground. And if I understand from your photographs and your description, The center of these two circles in 2006 are raised in the center from the ground? Oh, quite significantly. One of the pictures I sent you of a friend of mine, Paul Bolting, holding a tape measure. Um, It's a vertical picture. Mm -hmm. You can actually see very clearly in there how high that cone actually is and the size of it. And that his feet are actually sinking at least six inches into the rippled grass. Mm -hmm. 
Have there been any reports in that area of anything unusual in the sky? Not to my knowledge, but last time uh, I had a woman send me an email from the Gold Coast. She's in her 20s now. And down on the Gold Coast, the development there was nowhere near what it is now. Mm -hmm. And they had large open tracts and fields down there. When she was younger, and this is in the 80s, she saw circles like mine quite regularly. This is from the 2004 ones. She said they just saw them all the time down there in this particular area. And um, she said that she was down there one day near one of these big fields at a sports day at school. And she and a friend of hers, it may have been two friends, but at least one, looked up in the sky over the sea and there was this huge black cigar in the sky just hanging there. And she said something came out of the bottom of it, at least one or two craft, something flew out of the bottom of it and flew away. Right now, uh, Christopher is trying to see if he can get me in touch with this woman. I would like very much to interview her for Earth Files in Dreamland. Those large cigars have been something that have come up in the 50s and the 60s literature having to do with UFO phenomenon, but when it comes into the Earth mystery of crop formations, Whitley, uh, something like a large cigar or discs or craft, they really have not been a substantial link, and that's why I think this would be absolutely fascinating uh, to hear from people in that area where now we have these grass circles and where they said in the 80s they saw grass circles, and in their mind they are linking it to whatever this huge aerial object was in the sky. It's, you know, it's really fascinating, and it's a little bit different from what we have in England where there's never been much connection between the the crop circles and and big aerial objects. I think that you yourself once saw small red lights over a field, a crop circle field in England. Well, you know, this is also comes back into this question of these orbs that uh, Christopher got on photographs in 2004 at night. Right. They didn't see with their eyes, and when the group of us uh, there were seven of us, and we were in the east field, and we had that infrared scope, uh, star scope that I had, and we could see this an extraordinary hour display only through the infrared of that scope. We could not see anything with our eyes. There are people, obviously, who have videotaped those moving, what I call the mysterious lights in crop circles, uh, the videotapes of those go back to at least 1990, 91 period, and every scientist who has looked at those videotapes, and there may be 25 or 30 such videotapes now, estimate that the size of whatever those objects are is about 6 inches to 12 inches. We're talking about something extremely small, which might be, it, I'm, I don't know, but it might be what Christopher White and others have photographed but then you come back, why is it that there are these moments when people can see and videotape and, and track the camera on these lights, and a whole bunch more times when these strange glowing orbs seem to be on images, and sometimes even on videotape, when the person doing the videotaping and the ph uh, photographs never saw anything. I think this is one of the most intriguing part of the crop circle mystery. Well, it suggests that there are times when these things are emitting only heat and not light, which is certainly possible and reminiscent, by the way, of the objects that were taped by the Mexican Air Force, I believe, year before last, uh, off the wings of aircraft, which were not visible in a normal light, but right. were visible the in, the in, in the infrared, yes. Yeah, and... Uh, and part of this story, in addition to the uh, the orbs that can be photographed and not seen, and as you're saying, may be in heat, uh, is why is it that certain parts of the planet have reoccurring crop formations? Why is it that Conandale, why is it Wiltshire and certain parts of Wiltshire in the United States, there are very specific areas, especially in Ohio, that they repeat over and over again? And you can step back and say logic would say if it were some kind of meteorological phenomenon that has never been identified, it's certain it shouldn't be over 20 years going back to this, in some cases, the same field. 
It's a mystery. It's a tremendous mystery. Indeed. Indeed it is. And and then, you know, we go back to uh, just an article I read just very recently in the London Times a few days ago, crowing about the fact that UFO sightings are down and the British UFO Research Bureau has closed its doors and finally the crazies are going back under their rocks. It's most unfortunate, I think, that it, uh, that this mystery simply is not being addressed at any level, uh, in, in any a, any institutional level in our culture in a useful way. And in the crop circles, Whitley, it may not have anything to do with the classic ET UFO. Right. It may be something completely wildly more D- different. different. And and I, I, what I was going to conclude with saying was that the starkness of the evidence in a case like this. 